ready your Bibles, I'll have it up on the screen in a moment, but uh, if you we're going to uh, have a look at Hebrews in just a moment. What a wonderful service we've had this morning so far. It's really uh, been a blessing to me, and it's wonderful to be with you all again this morning. And, uh, you know, for this year, as uh, Peter mentioned in his welcome this morning, you know, really may the, the Lord be with you, may he keep you, may his face shine upon you and give you peace. And, uh, boy, doesn't this world need peace? Just a piece of Jesus would just be enough just a little bit more and a little bit more of him. We're going to come back to now the, the joy of walking in God's truth. And to remind us, it is not my truth, it is not your truth, it is God's truth, and we are to walk in it. The truth is in God, it's in Christ Jesus, and it's through the Holy Spirit, and when we are walking in it, it means we are living in it. We are living in the truth. And we understand more of the truth by the Word of God. And so, last week we were talking about, the, the, the or not last week, but it was part of last week, the, the joy, as it were, of by being walking in the truth, we understand the love that God has for us. And we couldn't see that any more clearly than looking at the prodigal son as he remembered the love of his father and he came back home. My wife, Shay, said to me this morning as we were talking about service and getting ready, she said, oh, what's happened to the prodigal son this morning? Is there any more prodigal son? And I said, no, the prodigal son's arrived home and he's in managed uh, isolation. He's in quarantine this morning. Uh, we're moving on to something else, but the prodigal son's just fine. He's arrived home. And let's remember these verses from John, as he said, For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. You are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And of course, we are reminded that it is Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So to be walking in the truth means to also be walking with Jesus Christ. He is with us. He abides in us, and we in him. So we are walking. It is a journey, and a great characteristic of our walk is the joy of the Lord. Who is walking with joy this morning? Who's feeling joyful just to be here together as we are one in, as, as members of, of one body in Christ? Sure, it is definitely that, isn't it? It is, a, it is a joyful characteristic of the Christian life to experience the joy. And as John says, I have no greater joy than this, than to know that my children are walking in the truth, which means we must be in the word it must be a major part of our life a major part of what we do the more we have of the word the more we have of the truth the more we will know the joy of the lord those things all go hand in hand i know for to be perfectly honest if i put down the word of god and it starts to collect dust on on my desk and uh, it's not been collected into my heart as it should be, my joy begins to slowly wane. And uh, I, I need to get revived, and I need to get back into the Word. I, if that happens for me, I'm sure it happens for each and every one of us. So to, to be in the Word is such an important part of what it means to be Christ-like, because He is the Word that was made flesh. I keep on going, sorry, Peter, I keep on coming back to you a few times. But even as Peter said in his welcoming words this morning from John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, the Word was with God, and all things were created through Him. The power of the Word of God is creation. 
and he has created each and every one of you who have received Jesus Christ. He has created in you the newness of life, a new life in Christ created by the word, the word that was made flesh and has dwelt among us. So let's go to slide three here. The joy now, last week was talking about with the prodigal son of, of knowing and having the, the, the love of God by knowing the truth. This is the next one, the joy of growing in faith by the truth. Not just an ordinary faith. You see, I can get onto an aeroplane, let's say let's say travel's allowed one day, let's hope sometime soon, and we can get on a plane, or maybe we get on a train, or maybe I just get into a bus. I exercise my faith that the, that the pilot of the plane, for example, who I've never met, we've never sat down and had breakfast, I've never asked him of his CV or of his, of his qualifications, but I'm, I'm trusting that he knows how to get this vehicle off the ground and into the air and able to land it again safely. There's an exercise of faith, but that's a little bit easier because I see everybody else is doing exactly the same thing getting on the plane, and if they're getting on the plane and they feel comfortable, well, that gives me a little bit of comfort as well. And it gives me a little comfort if I see the pilot, and I see he's got a, a few stripes on his shoulders to show that he is indeed a, a captain by rank. I see his uniform, but I still don't know anything about the man. I don't know whether he's having a bad day or whether, you know, he's, 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 how things are going. Oh, we have no idea. But by faith. So, but this faith, that's just a general faith that often we have to exercise on our daily basis. There is an element of trust, just living life. But this kind of faith, this type of joy that comes through growing in faith from the truth, from God's word. This is a supernatural faith, as we're going to see. It is not a natural faith of this earth, but it is from God himself. And so there it says from Romans, where does faith come from? Or how does it grow? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, or the word of God, you might also have in your Bible. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the word of Christ. How can I grow in faith? Well, this faith, this word, sums it all up. You know, many incredible things were done by people in the Bible because they had great faith in God and what God could do. It is the Word of God. It is the truth of God that has power. We just sung about there is power in the name of Jesus. But there is power to bring about an increase of faith. Now that's just one element of growing in faith. An increase of faith. Relating to well, what is faith? What is faith? It is a belief, and it is based on trust. And trust, which is based not by blind faith, but it's actually based on evidence. True faith is based, and trust and belief is based on sure evidence. And there is no greater evidence than the Word of God itself. There is enough evidence in the Word to bring about the knowledge and an increase and the coming of faith by his word, done through the power of God. It's not only what we can know about God, what we can believe and what we can trust, but it also becomes more personal than that. To grow in faith will also determine what you and I will attempt to do for God. Remember when Jesus was walking on the water? They saw him coming. They were out in the boat one night, the disciples. What did Peter do? What did Peter do out of faith? He said, Jesus, bid me also to come out onto the water with you. But when he saw the waves and the storms and began to sink, didn't he? He looked around at his environment all of a sudden, 
He realised perhaps he got out of the boat just a little bit too soon. But he got out of the boat nevertheless. It's what he attempted to do. He knew what he could do by faith when he was with Jesus. And beautifully, he wanted to get out of the comfort of his own boat. He's a fisherman after all. Fishermen are very comfortable by being in their boat. But he wanted to get out of the boat. He wanted to get out of his normal comfort zone. And he wanted to attempt something that he had never done before with Christ. To get out there and walk on the water. Not by himself. But he knew he could do it because Jesus was there. Faith. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. Not only to know to, to increase what we may know about what is true, but also what we can attempt to do by faith. Not necessarily seeing where we are going, but attempting to do it because we feel and we know that God will be with us. Because the word is truth, therefore faith can grow when there is clarity there comes knowledge and the knowledge of God. Let's bring up our main verse this morning from this wonderful chapter of Hebrews. Faith is the assurance. Faith is the starting point in all our dealings with God. We'll see this in the scripture and we'll see Cain and Abel, the difference between these two brothers. And faith is the means by which God brings rewards to us. And we'll see that in Enoch. And it reads there, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. They received their <laughs> applause. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. God spoke and it was done. So that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Abel was a man of faith. Cain was not. Abel's offering to God was therefore more acceptable to God than the sacrifice given by Cain. Through which he was also commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, his offering. And through his faith, though he died by the hand of Cain, he still speaks. His faith still speaks to us today, the very life of Abel. By faith, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken up. He wasn't put down. He was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found when they went looking for him, because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he also was commended. Let's see how many times people get applauded in these verses because of their faith. They, he was commended as having pleased God. He pleased God. And the last verse there, and without faith, it's what? It's impossible. It doesn't matter how hard a person tries to please God or to get right with God or to build relationship with God. It doesn't matter what you do. I have do this. I can do this. I can do this. I've, I've, I've done everything I've tried to do. It still won't please God because it hasn't been done by faith. It's been done by my own ability or my own attempts. And I haven't come by pure faith, belief and trust purely in who God is. So it's impossible to please him without faith. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Well, that's a wonderful blessing to finish that paragraph of scripture. Let's just have a moment of prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for the very gift of faith. 
Lord, we thank you we are made acceptable and you receive us to yourself by when we put our complete faith and trust in you and you alone. And more to the point, putting our complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross to pardon our sins, to forgive us our sins, so, Lord, that we can be made righteous in your sight. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this message that has come from your heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us all in our faith this morning. And, Lord, by the very word of God, the truth, we would experience just a little bit more of the joy that we can have as Christian believers because of our faith in you. Lord, bless us now through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Hide me again just in the shadow of your cross so you can receive all the glory. And I ask and pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen, amen. Well, if we look at the next slide here, I have uh, three wonderful characters in the New Testament. We have this woman here, the Canaanite woman, or sometimes she's known as the, the Sino-Phoenician woman. When Jesus did such a, a, quite an unusual thing one day, he went outside the boundaries of normal Israel, and he extended his ministry just over into the neighboring cities of Sidon and Tyre. Those cities are still there today. They're out towards the coast, towards the Mediterranean. It's quite an unusual thing to see Jesus do this because up to that point he was focusing on Galilee, which is the northern part of Israel. He would spend much of his ministry time up there. But here he extends the ministry. And I think that may be a good point for us today as a church. Are we extending our ministry as a church? Are we extending ourselves into the Otahu community or wherever over God? Are we extending the ministry? Because that's going to take some faith to do that. This Canaanite woman, she had, uh, she can be found in Matthew chapter 15. Let me just paraphrase here these, these three wonderful characters of faith. This woman, her faith can be characterized by a perseverance, a persevering faith. She's not Jewish. She's not really welcome in, in Jewish circles. And, but she approaches Jesus when she must have known something about Jesus. And she approaches Jesus and said, Jesus, I, I, have, a, I have a daughter here that's, that's uh, oppressed by a demon. That's right by an evil spirit. And Jesus says, sorry, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You're not of Israel. It, Jesus was quite blunt. Quite blunt. And he also says, you know, woman, it's, it's not right. Is it? It's not right that, that the, the children's bread should be given to the dogs. In other words, he's talking about her as a dog. Not because of any derogatory sense of, of her gender, but because in those days, anybody outside of Israel was considered a dog by the Jews. And I know it's not, it's not very nice, but that, that typified the Gentile behavior. Like dogs on the street, they just roam everywhere. They make their muck wherever they want. They, they're scavenging. That characterizes the Gentile nations, not like, the, not like the Jews who had received the light and the knowledge of God and the prophets and the revelations and the, the commandments and, and all that. They were a chosen people after all. So this woman, this woman, Jesus says, it's not right to give the children the bread. It shouldn't be given to dogs. And she has this incredible comeback statement. She says, yes, Lord, but doesn't even the dogs happy to be fed from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And she said, and Jesus said to her, what amazing faith you have. And at that moment, her daughter was healed. So she had 
the perseverance. She had the perseverance to take it to the Lord. And then we have this Roman centurion up here. He's not like your normal Roman centurion. Again, he's not Jewish. He's not of the household of God. He's not of the the faith of the traditional Abraham. He's a Roman after all. More than likely, he's, he's Italian, what we would say today. And you know what they are like. Very aggressive, very strong. You look at his picture, he doesn't quite live up to that kind of expectation, does he? This Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8, he had a paralyzed servant. Now, let me ask a, a simple question. What good is it having a servant if he can't walk? You know, a paralyzed servant. What good is that? How did he get paralyzed? I don't know. Maybe he had a fall. Maybe he had an accident. Maybe he got cerebral palsy. I don't know. But he's a paralyzed servant. Any normal Roman would have said, take him to the dump. Get him out. He's useless. Replace him straight away. I need somebody that, that can serve me. But this Roman centurion, he bought, he bought the need of his servant, the paralyzed servant. And it says there that the servant was, was suffering terribly. It adds those, these adjectives of his suffering. He was suffering terribly. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I will come and heal him. <laughs> Done and dusted. Great. But what did the centurion say? Lord, um, <clears throat> just one moment. I am not worthy for you to even come under the roof of my house. But just say the word and he will be healed. The centurion had faith. This Roman soldier had faith in the words of Jesus. He had a humble faith. He was humble. He showed humility. And Jesus said, I haven't found such faith in all of Israel. Because they were in Capernaum, northern Israel. And then we have this Blind Bartimaeus. Now, he's probably the most common and most... Who knows Blind Bartimaeus? He's a well-known figure, isn't he? Well, he was very earnest. He came, and it, well, he didn't come. He, he heard as Jesus was, was coming through Jericho, or as he was leaving Jericho, actually, to be more precise, with the disciples in a great cloud, a great crowd, sorry, not in a cloud of dust, but a great crowd. Bartimaeus, a, this blind beggar, it even tells us that he was the son of Timaeus. And he was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard, he just heard that Jesus was going to be passing by. He cries out, Jesus, son of David. Now David, of course, was king. So this blind Bartimaeus is appealing to the kingship. He might as well basically be saying, Jesus, king of Israel. Because Jesus would fall into the royal line of King David and he is rightful king by inheritance, by his heritage, his royal, his royal lineage. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And what do the crowd do? <laughs> Zip it, Bartimaeus. We don't want to hear your faith. We don't want to hear what you've got to say. Just be quiet and let us pass by. But he calls out another time. And then Jesus says, bring, bring him here. And straight away, Bartimaeus, he strips off his, his uh, beggar's coat and he comes to Jesus and he receives his sight. You see, so what we've got here, folks, with this Phoenician woman, we have a faith of perseverance. With a centurion, we have a faith on humility or humbleness. And with blind Bartimaeus, we have a, uh, this, this faith. He is very earnest in his appeal to who Jesus is. And what's that telling us? When we talk about growing in faith, most of the time we think about 
an increase in faith. Am I going to grow in faith? He must mean he's talking about, I want to increase my faith. And sure enough, that is a very good thing. But this morning, through these people, we learn about the quality of faith. It has a certain quality about it. Maybe there's an area in our faith that needs an increase of quality. Maybe it's an increase of the quality or characteristic of persevering, which means don't give up too easily. Just because you knock once and you don't get the answer, don't walk away and give up. Knock again. Maybe knock a third time. Maybe knock on the door of Jesus a fourth time. That's what this Phoenician woman demonstrates. She wasn't going to give up quite so easily. She knocked again and again, and then the Lord answered. You know, it's a good thing that sometimes we don't always get the answer in the first five minutes of our request. Because our faith will grow when Jesus looks at us and says, hmm, I just wonder just how sincere you are in your faith. Do you really believe that I will answer? I'll tell you what, I'll let you ask a second time. And I'll see just how patient and how persevering, how true and uh, as, uh, with integrity, just how much you really, really desire this. I'll test you. I'm going to test your faith. And in doing so, I'm going to bring you on a bit of a persevering journey. And through it, we'll grow. We'll grow in our persevering. We'll grow because we don't quit the first time. We don't give up so easily. We will persevere and we'll keep asking. We'll keep bringing our petition before the Lord. This is what this wonderful Phoenician woman, that's what she teaches us about the quality of her faith. And of course, there with the centurion, the increase of quality in his faith is that he was a man of humility. He was humble in his approach to Jesus. He didn't approach Jesus and say, hey, look, Jesus, I'm a centurion leader. I have men under me. When I say go, or if I say jump, they say how high. And by the way, I've been around in this loyal service for the Roman emperor for these last decades, and, and I've got stripes to my name, and I've won so many battles, and I've got a name uh, in my community he didn't, he didn't approach Jesus like that. He said to Jesus, you're much more worthy than I am. He approached Jesus with a humble faith. He didn't say, Jesus, look, I go to a, a Baptist church and we're Bible believing and, and I'm this and I'm that as a Christian and I can do this and I do this. No, he didn't say anything like that. He just said, Lord, you just have to say the word, but I'm not worthy for you to even come into my house. I wonder if we could grow our faith in a little bit more humility, like the centurion soldier. Or maybe it's growing with a little bit of more earnest. Who do we think we're talking to when we pray to Jesus? Oh, he's just, you know, a nice guy, and he was a good man, a good teacher. He says, hey, he raised a few people from the dead, and you know, Jesus, he's just my, he's just my buddy, you know, and uh, Bartimaeus appealed to the royalty of Jesus. You are king, King Jesus. King Jesus, you have authority. As a king, you have power and dominion. Jesus, you have the power that even blindness will obey you. You have the power, just say the word, and blindness will obey you. And here's the thing, the very interesting thing, my friends. The blindness that Bartimaeus had, even the blindness obeyed Jesus. People today won't obey Jesus, but blindness will obey the command of Jesus. Just as Jesus sat on the, the foal of a donkey, 
as he came, which, which a little donkey that had never been ridden before. It was a wild animal, in a sense. It hadn't been tamed. But when Jesus sat on it, even a donkey obeyed Jesus. And he rode into Jerusalem that often we call Palm Sunday. So, approaching like Bartimaeus, growing in our faith with a little bit more earnestness. Who are we talking to? We are talking to the word that was made flesh, the word that was was God and was with God and all things were created by him. Nothing was made that was made that was with, not without him. That's who we're talking to. Bartimaeus knew who he was talking to. The crowd was just following Jesus. Just follow the crowd. It was a popular thing to do as he went through Jericho. But Bartimaeus was crying out to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. So not just growing with the increase of faith, but how about growing in the quality of faith? Maybe we can uh, grow in the, the Phoenician quality of faith being that of persevering faith. The Roman centurion in his humble faith and the blind man, Bartimaeus, growing in his earnest faith. But all those are qualities. But here's the beautiful thing. In each case, Jesus rewarded faith. He rewarded the faith of the Phoenician woman. He rewarded the faith of the centurion soldier. Smelly and stinky as they are and big as an ogre as they are, he rewarded his faith. And he rewarded the faith of this annoying, noisy, loud-mouthed Bartimaeus on the side of the road. He still rewarded that faith. God loves to reward faith, belief, and trust in him. Do we have that as a church? Do we have that belief and trust, the type of faith that God wants to reward, to trust him and believe him in utmost in everything, above everything else? It doesn't matter what the, the weather forecast says tomorrow. I will still believe and put my faith and trust in God rather than put my faith and trust in man. That's our challenge to grow in faith. Let's look at a few quick blessings to close now. The truthful qualifier about growing in faith. If you are interested in growing in faith in some capacity, it's got to start with something like this. And Jesus said to him, he's talking to a father, if you can, all things are possible. For one who believes, immediately, in response to this statement by Jesus, immediately the father, excuse me, of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. What is Jesus basically saying in that statement? He's saying, do you believe that I can? That's it. How about you and I? Is Jesus saying to you, do you believe? Do you believe that I can? Do you believe that I can? Do you believe that I can? That's what Jesus is saying. And this man say, yes, I believe, but in all honesty, help my unbelief. You know what? Let's all be honest this morning. We all have different levels of unbelief. When it comes to something, we will be tested about the level of our unbelief. And here's the beautiful prayer to say to Jesus at that moment. Help my unbelief. Jesus wants to hear our honesty. So to grow the qualifier is to believe, can Jesus do it or not? Do we believe 
What do we believe in that particular case? Whatever your circumstances, do you believe? That's what Jesus is asking us. And if so, our faith will be excellent. To bring about doubt and to say, I'm not sure. I, I want to believe, but I just don't know. I, I, I'm bringing in doubt. And you know what? That's okay. Because when you're bringing in doubt, we're bringing in reason. A reasoning. Jesus, give me a reason to believe. To help my doubt. To help my unbelief. Give me the reason. And the reason is the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. The reason to believe is because of the word of God. The reason we don't believe sometimes is because we're not hearing the word of God. We're not in the truth. We're not in it perhaps as we should be. And when we have those moments of doubts, that's the time to dive into the word of God and to see our faith grow. Faith will come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Jesus is saying, do you believe that all things are possible unto me? That's the qualifier. Let's look at some joys. Because after all, growing in faith is a joy. It's a joyful experience to grow. I think back years ago and my level of faith was just so pathetic. And I wouldn't believe, and I, I, I didn't think I could do that in Christ. But as the years go on, it's a joy now to know that, yes, Christ is with me, as he is with you. But to grow in, as we grow in that faith and belief and trust, so the joyful experience. And people want to see the joy on our faces because they want to look at our life. And they say, hey, my friend, you believe. You say you believe, but I want to see it. I want to see it on your face. I want to see the joy in your life. I want to see the joy of the Lord. That is the evidence that other people may also come to faith. You say it, but I want to see it. I want to see it in you. So the joy, this one from James 1, 5, 6. Where's the joy? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him or her ask. Ask. Ask who? Don't ask me. Don't ask the elders of the church. Ask God. Who what? Who gives generously. Don't you love generous people when they go over and above what you would expect in their giving, whatever it may be? We love generosity. God is generous. He's very generous in his giving. Who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given him. It will be. I'm using wisdom as a great example. Because as we grow in wisdom, it will also help us grow in faith. And we'll experience the joy of walking in the truth in this regard. But let him ask how? In faith. With no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave tossed on the sea and driven by the wind. What's the main characteristic of the wind? Or one of the main characteristics of the wind? It's always changing directions. Today, it could be blowing from the west. Tomorrow, it could be blowing from the east. To be on the wave blown by the wind, is someone who doesn't have faith. They're just being tossed, just going from side to side, always changing, going this way, going that way, whichever which way the wind blows me, I will go. But faith is not like that. Faith is certain. It is sound. It's solid. It's built on the rock, just as the house built on the rock. And when the floods came and the storm came, it beat upon the house, 
And it was the house that was built on the sand that was washed away. And as Jesus said, so it is so true. Those that will build upon their life upon what I say is like the house built on the rock. So the joy of asking for wisdom will bring about a great sense of joy. And this also reminds us about making our prayer requests to the Lord. The joy of knowing that God hears us. Now, God hasn't told you personally that he hears you, but we believe it by faith. We believe it by faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let's look at the next one. Why else is there great joy in our hearts? Because we are walking in truth and growing in our faith. Romans 1.8 says, first, Apostle Paul saying here, first what? First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in some of the world. No, all of the world. He's talking about the church at Rome, the Roman church. And Paul is saying that I hear that your, your faith is being proclaimed in all the world. In other words, the faith of this church at Rome, everybody knows about it. Now, what can we say about that? That is encouraging. Who likes to hear things that are encouraging? The opposite of that, of course, is discouraging. Of course we want to hear things that are encouraging. When we hear things that are encouraging, that also builds up our joy. The joy of hearing such good things coming from this church at Rome. And by the way, there's not many other good things that would be coming out of Rome during these days. Perhaps you might hear the good news that a, a certain Caesar has, has died. Hip, hip, hooray. Only to be replaced by another Caesar by the name of Nero. Oh, not so good news. What good things can possibly come out of Rome? The church. And their faith has been proclaimed in all the world. That is encouraging. What about us at OCBC? Thankfully, we're not in Rome. Thankfully, we're not going to be going, we're not experienced right now about the persecutions of the Christians in Rome. How can OCBC be an encouragement to other churches? Do other churches hear about the faith of OCBC? That could be just a byproduct ministry that when other churches hear about the faith of OCBC, they will be encouraged and their joy will also be lifted up. Let's look at the next one. So encouragement and faith brings a great sense of joy. What else is there of that can bring uh, joy to our hearts? Also from Romans. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In other words, the righteous shall not live by their own doings, by their own works to get righteousness. No, they will, they will live by faith. The joy of growing in faith makes me know that I am accepted with God. That brings great joy to our heart, to know that I am living as a right person with God, righteous, not because of me or what I can do, but because of my faith in the one whom I put my faith into, into Jesus Christ. The joy of knowing that as I am accepted with God, I am on the right path of life. The righteous shall live. It doesn't say the righteous shall die. No, the righteous shall live. Are you living this morning? Are you truly living this morning? We can only truly live as God gives us true life, which he gives to us by faith in Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life brings joy. Joy 
is supposed to be in life. God didn't create life in Adam and Eve for them to have, you know, misery. It wasn't meant to be that way. But it came because of sin coming into the world. But we've got it back. What Adam lost, we've got it back again in Christ. The life is there now. And so the joy also. Quickly look at this one. We've got to close. But there is joy also so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Here's a great thing to be joyful about. The power of God is at work in you because you have faith in him, because you are trusting in him. And because as a church we are trusting in him, we don't put our faith in what other people say about us. We don't care if they make fun of us. We're not basing our life on their wisdom and saying all manner of things. No, our, our faith is, is not resting in the wisdom of men, but it's in the power of God. Are you experiencing the power of God? If you are, your joy will be there also as your faith is growing, as you see God at work. And last but not least, we've got to finish with Hebrews. From Abraham, the father of faith, as he's so often called. The joy is there because Abraham was looking to the future. Are you looking? What's your future looking like? Do you see a future that is going to be characterized with joy? It will be if you and I are like Abraham and we have our faith in what God is going to do in the future. Never mind what you are going to do or what anybody else is going to do. What God has said he will do for the future. Even Abraham was looking forward to the future revelation of God in Christ. All the way to the end of the Bible, Abraham could see it. And because he could see it spiritually, he lived by it day by day. He lived for the future that is in Christ day by day. For he was looking, not backwards, but he was looking forwards. To what? The city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Everything else might be crumbling around us at this time. Maybe they may be able to hold it together. Maybe they won't. But in any case, we are looking for what God is going to build in the future, where your future is, where my future is. And because we have a future, there we have a good reason to rejoice and to be very joyful about that promise future this morning. So let's all rise up, and I mean that literally. Let's all rise up with the joy of growing by God's truth. Growing in our faith by God's truth and experiencing the joy of that nurturing, growing faith. Let's just pause and reflect for a moment. And let's ask ourselves, where's my faith at this morning? Where is it? Have I put faith completely in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I know the joy of salvation, of being saved, of being promised the future glory with God who is, the, who is our builder and maker of the firm foundations that will be made and put into place when that time comes? Do I have that Phoenician lady kind of faith? Am I persevering in my faith? Do I need to grow there? Do I need to grow in a little bit, of, little bit more humility and humbleness and be like a, a Roman centurion? Can I grow in an earnest faith like Bartimaeus? Though he was blind and he could not see, yet he believed by faith in what Jesus could do. The Jesus of 
the Bible. King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for challenging us in our faith this morning. And we desire to grow, not just in the increase of it, but also in the quality of our faith. Lord, we thank you that we can put our full faith and trust and belief alone in you, even to be like Peter, who was willing to get out of the boat, get out of his comfort zone, and walk on water. Even if it was like Caleb and Joshua back in the Old Testament, when the spies went out to see the land, and it was them who had the faith that they said that they could take the land. But the ten other spies said, no, there are giants in the land, we can't do it. Lord, help us to be like Joshua and Caleb. Help us to believe that we can take that mountain in Christ. Lord, in all things, we want to believe that you can do it. We put our faith and trust in for you alone. And may you be glorified in our, in our faith that we place in you, knowing that as Hebrews has said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that indeed he is true in all things. And so we commit these things to our hearts, to our lives this morning. We thank you for speaking through us by your word, and our faith is increasing. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen, Amen.